right, everybody, let's me let's talk about awake tracheostomy. So I'm going to give you guys a few um, pearls on how to kind of set your patients and set yourself up for success with awake trachs. All right, guys. So the first thing is why. So if patients have any type of stenosis, um, any type of arrowing in the narrowing in the upper airway, upper airway obstructions, any type of distortion, abscesses, tumors, you name it, especially like, you know, supraglottic tumors, even like um, 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 subglottic tumors, kind of passive vocal cords, where essentially would make regular intubation in general, basically unsafe, <laughs> super dangerous, or impossible. Um, this is why you would do an awake tracheostomy. Um, these patients usually have some type of strider, even at baseline. Um, and we're just going to be talking about doing these under like electively, like this has been a planned elective case. Um, so, you know, you can use these principles similar to emergency cases as well, but we're going to kind of just walk through the thinking and the thought process doing these electively. But these patients will usually have some type of strider at baseline. Um, they might have had neck radiation in the past, any type of neck surgery, and even um, some type of vocal cord paralysis as well. All right. So these patients have been deemed by ENT, essentially, that they're, there's no other way um, to secure an airway for them besides to trach and doing that trach actually awake. All right. So the goal for these patients during these procedures is spontaneous ventilation, maintaining spontaneous ventilation, <laughs> and keeping the protective airway reflexes intact, right? Because the last thing we want to do is we want to let that airway collapse, all right? So some of the things I want you to be thinking about, even though in prepping your room, obviously, you know, number one, have a conversation with the ENT. You know, what is their plan? What are they thinking? You know, get a little more, like dive into the CT scans of the patient, stuff like that. Um, in your room preparation, I still want you to have the fiber optic in there, right? Have the glide scope in there, have all your video equipment in there ready to go, um, just in case worst case scenario and have smaller tubes, have like a six, a six, you know, six and a half, whatever it may be, have smaller tubes in there as well. All right. So still have all your backup equipment and your stuff ready to go. All right. My number one big thing though, for these patients is in pre-op is how can you set them up for success? And I do this for any case. If I'm doing a mat case and I have a patient who is, what I like to tell patients undergoing this procedure and even patients who I'm doing MAC anesthesia for um, that you know are really sick ASA4s, be it cardiac issues, respiratory issues, I always set up the expectation that, hey, you might not be 100% all the way to sleep. I have to do that for your safety. I'm going to be very careful and very cautious as to how much medication I give you because of X, Y, and Z. However, I am going to be right next to you, holding your hand in your ear. You might remember me hearing, you know, you might remember me saying, you know, take some deep breaths. It's okay. You know, saying your name, I'm here with you. You know, we're going to do this together. We're going to get through this procedure together, but due to these reasons, you may be in and out. You may remember certain things and that is just simply for your safety, but I will be with you um, the entire time and we will get you through this, you know, together and as safe as possible. All right. So that's like a key thing that I tell um, all my patients for this procedure so that they are, you know, so they have realistic expectations, they know why. Um, and then if they have concerns or questions, then it opens up that dialogue and we can talk about it. And I usually find they come into the operating room, you know, a little bit more calm. Okay. So as far as pharmacology, you know, always going to be my rule is that you can always give more but you can't take back, all right? So this is when you have to be super duper careful with your dosages. So Versed is a great one if there's no contraindications for your patient, especially for the, um, the amnestic part of it. But once again, taking into account their age, their sensitivity, did they take any medications at home, like a Valium or something like that, that's going to synergize with that. Um, but I will say with the word synergize, you want synergistic meds. So that's what you want here. Um, you know, some people have, you know, some people, and even me, sometimes you'll just do like a straight propofol type thing, or you can do a bunch of medications and just do little dosages of each. So you're not getting the, the full on side effects of any of the drugs. So that's always an option too. 
So Versed's a great choice for the amnestic, you know, effect starting at 0.5, maybe one milligram, seeing how the patient responds to that. And you are going to bring that patient into the room, get them set up as per usual, put it, I always, you know, put an oxygen mask over their face. You still have your circuit and everything ready to go. You can also use, you know, the circuit as well. Um, but then switching to a nasal cannula once they get started, because you don't want all that oxygen blowing in that blowing, you know, blowing there when they are using cautery and stuff like that. So really good communication with your surgeon is also um, a positive, but I will get a face mask or mask with a circuit on before anything happens right in the room to really like fill their tank up. And then you can switch over to, um, a nasal cannula and keep your FIO2 less than 30%. Okay. And um, the ENT surgeon should numb the area with some lidocaine. Um, so that's when you can slowly start titrating. And another thing to tell your patient, you might feel a little bit of a pinch and a burn in your, in your neck. That's going to be the numbing medicine going in. I'm, once again, I'm going to walk you. I'm going to give you a little medicine to relax you, but I'm going to walk you through that. We're going to do that together. Um, fentanyl is a good one, even like 25 mics. I truly love fentanyl. I love it for, for older people. It is cardioprotective. I think it's a great drug. Um, but just little bits at a time. So you could give even 25 mics of fentanyl. And there is going to be a time when they get deeper into that. Once they open that trach up, there's going to be a lot of pushing and a lot of pressure. It's going to be really uncomfortable. So in those instances, I might give a little touch of fentanyl. You can give maybe just one CC, 10 milligrams of propofol. And you can even give some IV lidocaine, depending on how much they have given and knowing your max doses of the lidocaine as well. Um, ketamine's another good one because it's going to, you know, they're not going to remember anything. They're going to be in this nice PCP state, but it's going to keep them breathing. So even using 10 milligrams at a time of ketamine, giving them a little touch of ketamine, if there are no contraindications, you know, with cardiac, you know, bad cardiac history, you know, you don't want to keep, you know, have anyone more hypertensive or tachycardic, but that's why I say, if you use these in just little teeny weeny bits of dosages, you're not, you usually are not getting those full on kind of, um, adverse effects or effects of these medications. Um, Presidex is also a great one using little bits of Presidex um, just to kind of smooth them over, but being careful and watching for, um, you know, bradycardia and knowing that repeated dosages of, you know, um, fentanyl, propofol, Presidex could, you know, cause respiratory depression and avoiding that. So these are just some things for you guys to think about, obviously discuss with your um, preceptors, you know, ahead of time as to kind of what their plan is. I tend to just use a little touch of everything, you know, a little touch of like one or two medications. Um, I think the last time I did one, I think we did um, like Versed and ketamine. And then kind of gave little touches of propofol just as the patient, as they really got in there and got uncomfortable. The other thing you guys need to be asking the ENT is are they using a, a cuff tube or a cuffed trach or a cuffless trach? And I have a post, if you search, I think tracheostomies, I have a post that talks about um, the differences of the two. But if there's no cuff, you can't really use positive pressive, positive pressure ventilation with that. So have a conversation with that because after these procedures, they might want to do a direct laryngoscopy to get biopsies. So in the case of mine, she, um, the ENT doc actually used a cuff tube. And then for the um, direct laryngoscopy, once we got the trach secured and in, then we ended up putting the patient under general anesthesia. You know, we hooked up to the circuit obviously ensured that we can ventilate before doing anything else. Okay. So always hook that up, make sure you're getting CO2 back. They're going to be chatting with you once that trach is confirmed in that place and they need to do any other types of procedures, then you can get your gas turned on and they might even need a little bit of paralytic. Just talk to them. We ended up giving the patient um, a little bit of succinylcholine. It was like a quick, you know, a quick procedure got the patient back breathing, and then took them off to the ICU. Okay. So just be sure you're asking all those questions and getting yourself and your patient set up for success. I hope that was helpful. If you have any other questions, let me know.